improving educational and vocational outcomes for incarcerated youth. I'm Nina Solomon, a Senior Policy Analyst here at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I'll be hosting the webinar this afternoon. A few logistical items before we get started. If you encounter any technical or audio problems during the webinar, you can ask a question in the chat box in the right-hand corner um, of your screen, or you can contact WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. During the webinar, you'll be able to submit a question at any point. To submit a question, please type it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. We will keep a running list of all content-related questions that we receive and ask panelists to respond to the questions during the last segment of the webinar this afternoon. We'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. Please also know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available online at the National Reentry Resource Center website. The link will also be emailed out to all those who have registered for today's webinar. During this afternoon's webinar, you'll learn more about a national survey that was conducted by the Council of State Governments Justice Center of all 50 states on how they're delivering and overseeing education for incarcerated youth. You will then hear from state leaders in Massachusetts and Florida on how their states are addressing these issues. We will end the webinar with a short Q&A session. To begin, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on the Council of State Governments Justice Center and the National Reentry Resource Center. The Council of State Governments Justice Center is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan membership or association of state government officials representing all three branches of state government. The organization provides practical advice informed by evidence on a range of criminal and juvenile justice issues. As part of this work, the Justice Center provides technical assistance to second chance and justice and mental health collaboration grantees, and we coordinate the National Reentry Resource Center in partnership with the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the Department of Justice. The Justice Center established the Reentry Policy Council in 2001 to assist state government officials that are grappling with the increasing number of people leaving corrections and returning to their communities. In 2005, we published the report of the Reentry Policy Council, which provided bipartisan recommendations for policymakers to improve the likelihood that adults released from prison or jail will avoid crime and become productive, healthy members of society. The report of that council and the research base behind it provided the basis of the Second Chance Act. The Second Chance Act was signed into law in 2008 and is the first federal legislation to authorize federal support for reentry programs. Recognizing how complex these initiatives are and the importance of integrating research and evidence, the Second Chance Act authorized the creation of a National Resource Center for Adult and Juvenile Reentry. And in 2009, following a competitive process, the Justice Center was selected to launch the National Reentry Resource Center and provide training and technical assistance to Second Chance Act grantees. In the last few years, the Justice Center published three seminal documents on juvenile justice. The first document provides five core principles to help state leaders reduce recidivism and improve youth outcomes. The second is an issue brief on how to better measure, analyze, and use recidivism data. And the third report, a study conducted in Texas, was recently released this year on the, effects of, um, on the effectiveness of state policies implemented to keep youth closer to home. These documents have laid the foundation for our juvenile justice program here at the Council of State Governments. What these briefs talk, while these briefs talked about the need to improve outcomes for justice-involved youth, they do not go into depth on what these other outcomes should be beyond recidivism. This led the Justice Center to focus more intently on education and workforce development outcomes that we know are critical for incarcerated youth to ensure that they lead successful and productive lives in the community after their release. And we know that there's perhaps no subset of young people that need a quality education more than incarcerated youth. At the federal level, the Department of Justice and Education recognized the need to focus on high quality education for incarcerated youth and last year, they jointly issued a guidance package with five key principles to improving education for this population of young people in secure settings. However, we know that states have struggled to prioritize and improve education for incarcerated youth for a number of reasons. First, we know that incarcerated youth are more likely to be overage and undercredited, have an educational disability, and be several grade levels behind their peers. Additionally, the changing context of the juvenile justice system has complicated the situation even further. In 1997, the majority of incarcerated youth were placed in state-run facilities. However, 
In 2013, almost two-thirds of youth were held in privately or locally run facilities. This has resulted in a complex patchwork of entities or agencies responsible for providing educational and vocational services to incarcerated youth. As you can see on this slide, in most states, a combination of juvenile justice agencies, local and state education agencies, and private providers are responsible for the delivery of educational and vocational services to incarcerated youth rather than one single state agency. In order to better understand what services, educational and vocational services, are being provided to incarcerated youth, what student outcome data is being collected and reported, and how states are supporting youth in transitioning into an educational setting upon their release, the Council of State Government Justice Center partnered with the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators to disseminate a survey to all 50 states earlier this year, and we're happy to say that all states responded. In early November, the Justice Center released a report, Locked Out, Improving Educational and Vocational Outcomes for Incarcerated Youth, which provides key findings of the survey and recommendations to improve policy and practice. I'm going to walk through some of the findings and recommendations today, but the full document is available on the Justice Center's website. The first major, major finding from the National Survey was that most incarcerated youth do not have access to the same educational and vocational services as their peers in the community, and they do not attend schools that have the same rigorous curriculum and student performance standards as traditional public schools. The survey revealed that just eight states are providing incarcerated youth with access to the same educational vocational services available to their peers in the community. This includes credit recovery programs for students that are further behind, GED preparation, career technical education coursework, as well as post-secondary opportunities. The survey also asked questions about facility schools accountability process and if facility schools are nationally accredited by a nationally recognized educational accreditor. In only 23 states, facility schools were nationally accredited and participate in their state's education accountability system. The second major finding of the survey is that most states do not collect, track, and report student outcome data for incarcerated youth in all facility schools, including those in uh, state-run, privately-run, and locally-run facilities. While in many states, the State Juvenile Justice Agency is collecting some student outcome data for incarcerated youth in state-run facilities, less than a quarter of states collect the same data for youth in privately-run facilities, a population that we now know accounts for the majority of youth that are incarcerated. And 60% of states, state juvenile justice agencies are unsure what student outcome data was being collected, if at all, for youth in these facilities. We also know that states are not analyzing and using the student outcome data they have to hold facility schools and educators accountable. You can see that in only 15 states, student outcome data is being used to evaluate facility educators, and in only 22 states are these data being used for accountability or corrective action purposes. And the third and final finding of the survey is that policies and practices employed in most states make it difficult or especially challenging for youth released from incarceration to make an effective transition to community-based educational or vocational services. In only 22% of states do they report having a designated educational transition coordinator or liaison to support youth in transitioning into an educational or vocational setting in the community upon release. And in almost half of states, there is no government agency responsible for this activity. And in many instances, it is left up to the parent or the youth themselves to find an appropriate educational or vocational placement. Additionally, the survey revealed that in most states, state juvenile justice agencies are not tracking educational outcome data for youth post-release, even basic educational indicators, such as enrollment in public school, enrollment in a job training or vocational program, or attaining a high school diploma or job or vocational credential. Um, you can see on this slide that in only 20 states are juvenile justice agencies collecting information on whether youth after their release from incarceration are enrolling in a traditional public school setting. The report also provides six main policy and practice recommendations to help states improve educational and vocational outcomes for incarcerated youth. 
Under each of these recommendations in the report, you'll find uh, additional information as well as examples of states that have put these policies into practice. The first recommendation is to require all facility schools to provide incarcerated youth with access to the same educational vocational services that are available to their peers in the community. This also includes complying with relevant federal laws around individualized education plans and meeting the needs of students with special education or special um, or disabilities. The second recommendation is to hold all facility schools accountable for student performance standards and meeting college and career readiness that are aligned with state requirements for traditional public schools. This includes setting performance targets, but also providing a structure that supports struggling schools, as well as implementing consequences for schools that are failing, similar to how the structure works for traditional public schools. Third recommendation is around tracking data, and tracking data on a minimum set of key student outcome indicators for incarcerated youth and developing the infrastructure necessary to collect and analyze these data. The fourth recommendation is to establish formal processes for reviewing student outcome data for incarcerated youth and using these data to evaluate and improve student performance and school performance. It's not enough just to collect student outcome data, but to use that data to improve policy and practice. The fifth recommendation is around reentry to designate a single agency responsible for ensuring youth's successful transition to community-based educational or vocational setting after release from incarceration. And the last recommendation outlined in the report is to require juvenile justice and education agencies to track and report on a minimum set of student outcome data for youth post-release. This includes improving collaboration between juvenile justice and education agencies to track data and use the data to improve the transition process for youth coming out of incarceration. As I mentioned, the full report is available on the Council of State Government's website. I'd like to now turn it over to Christine Kenny from Massachusetts, who will talk about her state's efforts to improve education for incarcerated youth. Christine currently serves as the Director of Educational Services at the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services, where she has held this role for the past 14 years. She manages a statewide contract for educational and workforce services that is administered by Commonwealth Corporation and its partnering agency. She also collaborates extensively with the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in the provision of special education services to youth receiving education services in Department of Youth Services facilities. Christine? Thank you, Nina, and I wanna thank Council of State Government for asking Massachusetts to be a part of this. Um, and we were happy to see someone interested in doing a survey nationwide and um, having some results. Um, and thank all of you out there that are taking time out of your day for um, this important um, conversation. Um, the slide that's up right now is actually um, a piece of artwork uh, that one of our young people uh, did in one of our programs. Um, so I wanted to share that because um, we encourage art uh, within our programs and um, we uh, do a art show every year with our young people and um, they're a very talented group. As Nina mentioned, um, Massachusetts, uh, we manage, uh, we have a statewide contract with Commonwealth Corporation, which is a workforce development agency here in Massachusetts, and we subcontract with the Collaborative for Educational Services, um, which is an educational service agency. And Comcor, um, it's, it's a wonderful partnership and I um, want to give a shout out to my colleagues at both Com Commonwealth Corporation and uh, the Collaborative for Educational Services. Um, they're essential for us to do our work and it has been um, a great partnership over the years. And somewhat of a unique one, um, many years ago we went through what we called an education reform within um, Massachusetts Department of Youth Services in which we knew we needed to um, look at our educational services differently and one of the pieces was also having that uh, workforce development piece for our young people. And so um, to be able to contract with an agency such as Commonwealth Corporation um, I think is um, has been such an asset to our work and the Collaborative for Educational Services um, with them being an educational service agency has really provided us with a level of 
expertise and a set of expertise um, that was lacking um, within a state agency to really, to which we felt like we could provide, um, you know, a robust, you know, not only a workforce and retain a workforce around our teaching staff, but also our curriculum and the activities for the youth and being able to um, track outcomes. Uh, we're not perfect. I say we're, it's always evolving, um, but it is a great partnership um, as we move forward. And um, the Collaborative for Educational Services is, uh, they do provide the education. We have 54 facilities statewide and they provide the education and the teachers, the professional development, et cetera, in, um, for all facilities in Massachusetts. So we are one of those states um, that ticked off um, in the survey that we are um, have a single provider. Uh, we do have state and um, privately run facilities um, in Massachusetts, so some of our uh, facilities are state run and some of them are privately run um, with our partners in, um, in the provider community that are nonprofit. Um, but the teachers are all under the one contract. Um, our vision for educational services, um, we start with a positive youth development approach. Um, we really actually have, uh, try to have young people start thinking about their future and being future ready and what will help them and how we can support them in their successful transition into the community. Um, and we do um, have um, a positive youth development, like I said, approach, and we look at that through that lens for all the work that we do. Our education mission, um, as Nina um, spoke about and all of you I'm sure are aware of, um, our young people are over age sometimes for their grade level, so we really have um, throughout the years had a strong focus on literacy and numeracy. As young people come into our programs, they're coming from a transient background sometimes with their school, um, so we do focus on the lit literacy and numeracy. We also try to focus on their social and emotional skills. And we also, again, are looking at that uh, future ready piece around job readiness, vocational training, um, work ethics, employment, and thinking skills for lifelong learning. We really are trying to um, ensure that all our uh, staff look through this lens. It is not just one thing, it's all things together. It's extremely important. Um, and. The uh, social and emotional piece, again, as you all know, um, sometimes um, has, you know, is the first thing that folks look at, um, but we are really trying to have folks look at the young person as a whole and um, ensuring um, a, a success as they move through the system. We have a foundation and approach um, in our education initiative, and again, I think this has evolved over the last several years. Um, when we went through our education reform, as I spoke about over 15 years ago, um, we were really trying to stabilize um, our workforce, and that is why the partnership with Commonwealth Corporation and the Collaborative for Educational Services was so important. We really wanted a vision, but we also needed to have a stable workforce. Um, and as we've kind of reached those goals, our foundation and approach has um, really taken on that the student really is the, the center of our discussion, and we really take a personalized approach to that. And then we really want to think about exit at entry. Um, so we're thinking about college and career readiness. Um, what the transition activities may be for a young person. And we're looking at not only their progress while they're with us, um, but also their uh, progress after they transition. And all of that cannot be done unless we have a really um, tight alignment and coordination of systems internally and externally. And by that I mean internally within our residential programs and 
externally as a young person transitions back into the community and how we are connecting them with either a uh, which pathway they're on, whether it's a school, if they're going back to school, or if they are, have a job, they might have both. Um, are they in a post-secondary opportunity um, that they need to be connected with? And there's, you know, many people within the system that assure that those that coordination is happening for that young person so that all the other pieces fall into place. Um, but we really have moved to a, a personalized approach for the young people so that they themselves ha can set their own goals and see, and see how those go their own goals may evolve over the year over the year or months that they may be with us and how we can support that. The Council of State Government locked out, I just, the Massachusetts highlights, I think was the collab, I just want to highlight what was in the report around the collaboration between juvenile justice and education agencies, our transition services, and shared data. And I will go into all of those um, pieces in the next few slides. The next slide, um, I call this, it looks like a compass. Um, I, this is one, again, a, a foundation around our, the work that we do here in Massachusetts. Um, I know I mentioned it before, but we really do try to focus on exit at entry. And this um, description here really looks at when a young person comes into a DYS setting, um, they go through an assessment process, they may be in short or long-term treatment programs, and then they go back out into the community with support. And this is how education kind of interacts with all of those pieces. And this is really, um, it is a compass for us to try to um, stay on track with the young people. And at, at the top of this, you can see at 90, 60, 30 days, um, and then when they transition into the community, the 30, 60, 90. Um, those increments of numbers are so important and something that we really do try to have all our staff um, focus on as young people are making a transition. We find that this time frame is a very important time frame for our young people. So as they are looking at 90 days out, um, transitioning into the community, um, what are all the supports that we need to be, you know, be putting in place? So um, you can see the phases also on the bottom, um, and some of that, I don't need to read it um, to you, but the, some of the activities there go along um, with those with the phases and how we are preparing young people um, and then actually being able to transition them into the community and then monitor their progress um, as they are in the community. In the uh, Council of State Government report, uh, one of the pieces of our work um, it's a significant piece of work that we do. We have a cohort of um, staff. They're called education and career counselors. And they are assigned um, to stu our young people or students um, as, a, as they're committed in Massachusetts. That's the word we use to the Department of Youth Services. At this time, they're also assigned a caseworker as well. So um, the Education and Career Council, though, is uh, responsible for the education uh, pathway for the young people, and they coordinate with that caseworker for as long as um, the youth is with us. And in Massachusetts, that could be until age 18 or age 21. The Education and Career Councils, I can't emphasize enough um, how um, important that pieces around how they, they liaison with the, our local um, school districts. In Massachusetts, we have a number of school districts here, and they all have different um, graduation requirements. And 
the education career counselors work um, diligently with those school districts to ensure that our young people, when they are in, in, within our facilities at DYS, are receiving and doing the work that will transition and they will be able to get credit recovery when they transition back to their sending school district in their home community. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read everything on these slides, um, but it really, the education and career counselors, we have evolved this position over the last several years into really is a guidance council model, um, and it is actually based on um, what we have here in Massachusetts and aligned with what our Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has for um, guidance counselor um, requirements, et cetera. So they really are liaisoning with the public schools, but they're also, um, again, taking that personalized approach with young people um, for goal setting and really understanding where a young person is and where, their, where the goal might be. Um, and that may be school. Um, we also have young people that already have a high set um, or GED um, in Massachusetts. GED is now high set, um, or they may already have a high school diploma. So, what is the next goal for that young person? Is it career readiness? Is it post secondary education, or possibly both? The education and career counselors, I have um, a list of their examples of their duties, um, which is uh, many, <laughs> um, but they really are the person that is working with the casework staff and the residential staff within those 54 facilities that I talked about to ensure that the young person, the student, is connected to their educational experience um, no matter where they are. And if that educational experience is, again, something that they've already received a high school diploma or a high set, they are taking on that guidance counselor role, again, to ensure that that, person, that, that young person and the, all the other caring adults that are working with that young person really are focused on the goals and, the, and what that young person um, is working towards. So that goes from everything from making sure their transcripts are in place to um, possibly taking, um, you know, the SATs or filling out financial aid forms um, and, again, sitting with young people to um, ensure that they are making progress um, once they are set into a, if they are in school or they are in a placement, a vocational placement or job placement, they're also ensuring um, that they're reaching the, their goals around those placements. Um, this, the other part of the Council of State Government um, report um, focused um, on our partnership with um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, which is our, um, our State Department of Education here that is um, ESE. And our partnership with them, again, the, the slides that are coming out, they're kind of dense, but our partnership with them um, has been extremely important and our partnership goes for anything, everything from a data exchange um, memorandum of understanding to um, classroom practices and um, protocols and also co-planning with the special ed, uh, special education um, and Again, putting in, like looking at a systemic approach to practices and processes that can be implemented within the JJ settings. So here in Massachusetts, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is responsible for the special education of um, the young people in the facilities. It's called special education in institutional settings. Uh, more than 50% of our young people are identified with having a special education need. And um, so therefore this obviously um, lends to um, really clean alignment, clear alignment with um, this, with the Department of Elementary Second and Secondary Education, the SEIS folks, so that those young people are getting the services um, that um, are 
are deemed necessary by that, their IEP. Um, one of the other pieces I mentioned was the, um, a data exchange. This has um, been, we developed an MOU um, several years ago with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And this piece has, um, because we have so many school districts in Massachusetts, um, this piece of work around the data has been extremely important so that we understand where our youth have been in the past uh, before we receive them in our, um, actually it's not before we receive them, but as we receive them into our facilities. Um, young people may show up in our detention facilities, our pre-adjudication facilities, and, um, or, or are committed to the Department of Youth Services. And this data exchange has been extremely important um, as, so that we can look at their district information, their sending school district information. So this is a data exchange that we do with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education around the youth um, that are uh, in our facilities. Um, again, there's other pieces of our, um, these slides are dense, but I, I wanted to um, show the, the different types of work that we are doing uh, with, with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education around our coordination and alignment with them. Um, the last couple of slides, I just wanted, we have, um, we have a new data system uh, within Massachusetts over the last couple of years. Um, we have been collecting data on high school diploma and high set or formerly GED in Massachusetts for the last several years. Um, the one um, piece of information here is that actually in Massachusetts, our overall census has gone down, um, but as you can see by the numbers, um, the numbers have actually um, stayed the same. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the, our our high school diplomas and our, our high set GED numbers um, we find have um, actually stayed pretty consistent over the years. We're very pleased by that. We have um, put a lot of effort into ensuring that young people receive credits. We don't grant high school diplomas. Um, our young people always stay attached to their sending school district, to so their school district. Um, if they are uh, with us at DYS, they are, um, their school district uh, grants them credits for the work they have done and they um, actually graduate from those school districts. Um, we have also put some resources into the HiSAT GED. We have a relationship also with um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that oversees that piece of work and we, over the years, that piece has evolved as well um, in which we have uh, been able to have practice um, tests for young people and our, and our young people actually testing within the facility for the high set and GED, um, which has um, been an exciting piece for us as um, young people used to only be able to uh, test in the community and not in our facilities. Um, we've had our post-secondary enrollment um, we've had, uh, again, we're tracking these numbers, um, and we have had 35 young people uh, last academic year um, be enrolled in post-secondary courses. And we also, through um, our educational program, have tried to look at industry-recognized credentials. Um, these are just a couple of them um, that I wanted to put on here. We also um, have young people, again, because we have a personalized approach. Um, if a young person is interested in um, the restaurant business or they may, uh, we will hook them up and have them serve, serve safe certified. Uh, we have young people that have done um, a personal training certificate or an OSHA certificate. Um, but we actually run um, the two that I put on here, the um, CTEC, um, some of you may have heard of that. They, um, have programming um, in other states. Uh, we have young people that go through the copper wiring program at one of our secure treatment centers, and last year eight students earned their copper wiring certificate. Uh, we also have um, health educators um, who have, over the last couple of years, each year um, 
take a couple of weeks out of the year, usually um, the school vacations, either February or April, and they do a special session for young people to receive um, CPR and first aid cert certificates. So we have a large number of young people that have gone through that. and. We think that's um, a good stackable credential for our young people, um, something that they can put on a resume as well. So I want to thank everyone for their time today, and I'll pass it back to Nina. Great. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, and I see folks typing in questions into the chat box. Um, please continue to type in those questions, and we will get to them at the end of um, the webinar. Um, I now want to turn it over to Julie Orange. Um, Julie is the Director of Education in the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice, and she has over 17 years of educational experience teaching in Title I schools and in program accountability. Um, her accountability focus has included the Department of Juvenile Justice schools and teacher and principal preparation programs. In her current role, she's responsible for the development and implementation of education policy related to students served in day treatment, detention, prevention, and residential Department of Juvenile Justice schools in Florida. In this role, she collaborates with school districts and providers to ensure educational contracts are followed and high quality services are being provided. Julie? Hi, thank you so much. Um, I am going to be tag teaming with um, Jason Gatanis. He is the Policy Research and Accountability Coordinator at the Florida Department of Education. And he is going to dive into the specifics on the outcome measures. And I'm going to give you some background before we get to that point. Um, just to kind of set the stage to let you know kind of some, some history, the process in Florida, we have over 100 Department of Juvenile Justice programs, and that is the full continuum. We have prevention, we have um, detention facilities, we have day treatment facilities, as well as residential programs. And within each of the counties where um, the schools lie, the DJJ programs, the school districts are responsible for the education. So prior to 2009, the Department of Education had a contract with um, Florida State University and they were um, providing annual quality assurance reviews within the Department of Juvenile Justice uh, programs. And this was an educational review that would, um, as possible, coincide with the Department of Juvenile Justice review. And that process was, um, again, funded through the Department of Education, and um, that project was awarded to Florida State University. And the outcome reports from those on-site reviews were provided to the school district superintendents, the principals of each of the schools, and of course the facility administrator um, each year. And where we used those results, um, multiple areas, but one of the things that was very beneficial is we were able to recognize our high performing DJJ schools as well as districts because we had district standards as well as school standards. And we were able to um, identify the ones that were lower performing and provide technical assistance to those schools. And in some cases, we were partnering the districts that were high performing with some of the lower performing so that they could learn from each other. We also had a process where we used peer reviewers. They were an integral process, part of the process, because the respect level of the peer sharing with the peer in the neighboring district how it works in their district and how they've overcome those same challenges was very beneficial. So that process was um, working and we had um, superintendents that would receive these reports and of course um, nobody wants to be identified as um, low performing and so sometimes we would um, have cases where we would be able to help the schools leverage resources based on these reports and it was very beneficial to bring the issues of DJJ education to um, the people in the district that, that can make changes. So that process was um, very much needed. Now in 2009, there was proviso language that was written that stated that educational reviews would only occur if funds were available. So at that point, the reviews ended. Um, that was when funds were scarce, and um, those were, that project was not continued. So since that time, there has not been any on-site quality assurance reviews of DJJ education in Florida. So that sets the stage for the impetus behind the legislation that was written a couple years ago 
to support the evaluation of DJJ schools. Um, of course, we all live in the accountability age, and the traditional schools um, in Florida are they're receiving you know an A through an F rating each year, and our schools are not falling under the traditional measures. So in our cases, between this time frame from 2010 to now, what we've seen in some districts is that because there's not a tool that's used, a uniform tool that's used across all of the districts and all the DJJ programs, they're not able to leverage with their um, districts all the resources that they need to provide the high-quality education. So we've had um, district support as well as provider support because in our state um, we have about 40% of our um, districts that have DJJ programs, they have opted to contract with a private provider to provide the educational services. And the providers were very much in um, collaboration in developing the legislation that is going to take us to the point where we're going to explain those outcome measures. So um, this legislation was written in 2014, um, Senate Bill 850. And the specifics that 850 really has the provisions within here, it's going to really focus on the roles and responsibilities of the school districts, the um, cooperative agreements that have to be in place. Um, much of the focus is on transition services and process, and then the accountability process that has to be in place. So those are kind of the focus areas. And I'm going to walk you through the highlights of this. And there is a, a slide in here that gives you access to go and read the entire um, language if you, you'd like to go back and see that. But I'm just going to give you the, the um, broad view. As far as the roles and responsibilities um, regarding the districts, it's very important that we make sure that it's in writing and that it's clear that these educational services really, we can't do a one-size-fits-all approach. We have to make sure that we're looking at serving the appropriate needs of our population. And we also have to make sure that it's clear that our students need to have access to those same courses as well as resources that they do in traditional schools. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different statutes listed in this particular slide, but those are referencing making sure that the virtual courses that students do have access to those courses as well as those same um, materials and resources. So that has been very helpful in conversations with um, districts and providers now that we do have that um, in law. Also the cooperative agreements, it really defines what each of the district school boards um, within that cooperative agreement, what they're responsible for and what the Department of Juvenile Justice is responsible for. And we had cooperative agreements um, prior to this as well, but this language was strengthened so that we are clearly defining um, the roles and responsibilities even w with the contract providers because sometimes what was happening is a district is ultimately responsible and if they contract the educational services out to a provider, it was not always clear who was doing, you know, who was responsible for which of the services when those were contracted. So. Now that language has been strengthened um, due to this Senate bill. Additionally, transition services, um, just as Christine mentioned from Massachusetts, the focus is always on making sure that you are looking at transition upon entry. We're not waiting until exit to start beginning the transition focus. Yeah, she does that. Right there, there. Also, within um, coordinating to make sure that the school districts are working with the, the juvenile justice education providers to develop those individualized transition plans. And that is a process that is reviewed during their monthly treatment team meetings with the students and they're reviewing every aspect of that plan with all the folks at the table that are coming to discuss specifically what those individual students' transition needs are and it really it defines within the law the expectation of who has to be there at a minimum and we've done um, a much, much better job of really engaging um, the student families along the way to make sure that it's not just at the end where, the, where you're preparing the last 30 days for the students to come back in, but we are unifying that approach along the way. And that's been an important shift. You also notice that within this requirement that personnel from the school district where the student will return, that is a big focus in preparing for the transition. And that is something that we have to make sure that those, um, the correct people from the district are 
on the phone within the process being engaged with this because they're, the receiving district is going to be the one determining where the student goes back to school and it's important for them to see the progress that the student has made during that time when they're in a residential commitment program. So we have seen, um, you know, better collaboration there. We have a process now that's um, called community reentry team meetings and those occur 30 days, around 30 days before a student returns back to their home community and it is a requirement that the school district representative from the receiving school participate in that process and a representative from the one stop or career center where that student um, is returning also participates so that those needs can be addressed with the parent on the phone or um, the student on the phone and all of the, basically all the stakeholders that may touch that particular student um, depending on what their needs are. We also were able to um, get language to specify that a school district is not allowed to maintain a standardized policy that forces all students returning from a juvenile justice program to be placed into um, a, an alternative setting. There has to be an, a way to make sure that we're looking at the individual needs of students. So we are um, thankful for that process and it is definitely a learning process because many districts had policies in place for many years that would require the students to go back through an alternative school and um, basically uh, prove themselves before they could come back to a traditional school and in some cases that alternative school still may be the best placement when they come back but it can't be across the board for every student. It really does have to be an individualized decision. So. Um, that again has um, been a, a process that we've been working with districts on. Again, I mentioned the uh, one-stop career representatives and they are also a part of the process when a student comes back so that they're well aware of what opportunities the students um, can access and again the individual needs are something that we are continuing to um, make sure we're bringing to the forefront that we are looking at the student's performance and their individual needs throughout the time that they were in the residential program. As far as um, DOE and uh, Department of Education and Department of Juvenile Justice oversight, that was also strengthened within this language and it really looks at making sure that our agencies collaborate to provide that oversight and guidance so that we are helping those school districts and education providers and reentry personnel so that they can effectively plan and implement. So we've done um, a really good job of working together and making sure that we are having um, we have a technical assistance call every other month with our um, school districts and education providers and focusing on topics that um, they are concerned that they need, they need some guidance on, they have questions about. So it is much more of a collaborative process now that we have this, um, you know, goal that we're working towards the outcome measures. Also the transition data. Um, one of the ways that we're looking at making sure that all the districts are not continuing to have those standardized policies to force all of the students back into a traditional school is um, the Department of Education reports um, February 1st of each year to the legislature the number and percentage of students who are returning to an alternative school, um, a middle school or a high school upon release and also those attendance rates before and after the students participate. So what we're working towards is making sure that that's reported uh, district by district so we are able to identify where we still need to provide additional technical assistance to assist them in making sure that um, they are, um, you know, really looking at this on an individual basis and making sure that we're making the, the right decision for each of the students and, um, you know, looking at the progress that they have made. I did go through the slides and try to identify where this linked back to the locked out report. So um, if you look at the bottom there in red, I tried to keep it in red uniform throughout the slide so that you could go back and reference some of the areas that Florida is um, doing and how that relates back to um, the particular report. So you'll see here the, the second recommendation, 2-2. Two, two. Now, also within Senate Bill 850, um, a big part of this particular um, legislation was the accountability section. And this is what um, established that the Department of Education will either operate it directly or indirectly through a contract. They would now have a mechanism to provide accountability measures to annually assess and evaluate our juvenile justice um, educational programs. And this would be based on 
student performance data, and it identifies within Senate Bill 850 specific areas that have to be addressed. It also identifies that it has to be a process where it's a consultation with the Department of Juvenile Justice, the district school boards, as well as the education providers, and that it's, it's a formal rule development process, which is exactly where the state of Florida is um, in the middle of at this point is accepting um, feedback on the proposed rule. So it is very prescriptive within um, the language identifying exactly um, you know, the focus and the process where it has to be, and then of course, you know, additional measures can be added. Again, the, this um, particular slide 15 has the text available if you wanted to go, and this is um, on, this particular bill covers a lot of areas, but sections 29 through 32 are the, the specific um, meat of what's applying to DJJ education specifically. And um, this was signed into um, law back in June of 2014, and it has um, led us to the point where we, um, through the process with the Department of Education, there was already a rule that was adopted in February of 2015 that focuses specifically on the educational services. And um, you'll see on the slide it, it does identify, it contains nine different sections and it really focuses in on that transition area, the instruction and academic expectations, the student assessments, and it really um, defines exactly what's expected within the statute. So that process um, has been completed through that rule development. Now there's an additional rule that is currently under review, and at this point I'm going to turn it over to, to Jason Gatanis. Jason, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me, Julie? Yes. Okay, great. I'm sure it's complicated. Great. <laughs> and I apologize in advance because I'm driving back uh, from another presentation I had earlier, so it's going to be significant for what I think there's a little bit of trouble hearing you, Jason. I don't know if you can speak up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm driving back to the 60% of the time. I think we might have to go to plan B. Yeah I, think Julie, yeah, I think we might have to go to somebody else because I don't think we're able to okay. hear him on the on the webinar. Right. Okay. And can you, um can you guys not hear at all? It's it's pretty low, so I don't think that we're gonna yeah. be able to catch most of what you're saying. Are you there, Greg? Yeah. I don't yeah, I'm think here. so. This is okay. Greg. Greg Hand? Yep. Greg, excellent. Okay. Greg Hand is our is through the Department of Education. He is the educational policy analyst that works with Jason and they are really the two that helped um, lead us to where we are now with this and so we will turn it over to Greg at this point. All right. Um, starting on uh, slide 22, um, this section of the proposed rule development. Um, just kind of gives a framework for what the rules uh, sort of set up, um, the, uh, what's the purpose of it, um, what's the actual definitions that are, are part of the rule, uh, the framework for the rating and uh, specifics about the rating system, and the, um, for each procedure, um, how the score was going to be calculated and rated, and then an overall accuracy and representation of the um, performance data. So the purpose of the rule is to implement the performance rating system um, provided by the statute. And, uh, and then we have the following definitions, classification score, common assessment, uh, what a DJJ school is. And so the DJJ school, um, obviously the Department of Education um, has worked with the Department of Juvenile Justice in identifying the specific um, programs um, that are part of DJJ and uh, linking up the correct DOE school ID with that. And um, we'll be um, merging information between the two depending on the measure. Um, the design length of stay is essentially how long each program is, does, uh, has its average length of stay. So um, for, this really only matters for the secure residential facilities. Um, so the ones that are going to be nine months or longer. An eligible student, um, we'll kind of get more into that, but uh, it's basically a cohort 
um, of kids that have to be there at least right now. It's currently at a 40-day length of stay uh, to be considered eligible, and in some instances, you will have to have been released from the program in order to be considered an eligible student. Well, that is the next definition, which is exiting students, which is kids that are actually released um, from the facilities. Learning gains are calculated um, basically the same way that all other school learning gains are calculated with the exception of what's done on the common assessment. The common assessment that kind of skipped over is developed by uh, WIN, and the um, WIN has a assessment that, is, that, that gets collected uh, on entry and on exit. So we'll be looking specifically at assessments that have both a pre and a post. Uh, sufficient data, uh, right now we're saying that you need to have at least 10 students out of a facility to consider and, and per measure for it to be considered uh, sufficient data. And then the program type, and there are three major program types that we're looking at in terms of schools, which are day treatment facilities, um, residential facilities, and, uh, and PACE as a prevention. The next is the three ratings that will uh, ultimately come up in the end for each measure, and it will be either commendable, acceptable, or unsatisfactory. There will be a 14-day uh, data review period um, that will uh, be allowed for by providers to um, issue uh, any kind of concerns about, about the scores or the calculations, at which point in time we will review those and, uh, and make updates to data as necessary. Ratings are um, only going to be based on the measures for which there are sufficient data, and like I said, that's going to be whether or not you had actually a representation of at least 10 students. There are up to 10 components included across um, all, um, those are the 10 measures that we're going to be looking at. Um, basically, you will be rated on however many of those 10 that you had um, as, an el as eligible for the particular program. Uh, they will all be based on a percentage calculation to begin with and then rendered down into the three rating systems. Students must have been in the program for at least 40 days, as I said before, um, and the methodology of computation for some components may be revised depending on um, the feedback that we're getting about the rule that's currently being um, drafted. So starting with the actual components, um, like I said earlier, the common assessment developed by WIN, we will be looking at uh, pre versus post um, Overall level, uh, currently there are only uh, levels um, that, that are from three to five, I believe, and so we are working with WIN on establishing a level one and a level two. If a student is at the highest level, as pre and post, then that's gonna be considered a, a gain or, or met expectation, if you will. Learning gains for ELA and mathematics, which are the next two slides, follow the same process for the most part as the school grading process um, over, uh, in general with the Department of Education. Um, we will be looking at actual learning gains on the FSA assessments for ELA, and that will be um, grades three through 10 and for mathematics, that will be grades three through eight on the FSA, and we'll also be including algebra, geometry, and algebra two EOCs. Attendance rate is going to be looked at in terms of uh, non-DJJ, or DJJ students who are in a non-DJJ school in the prior year, and in the subsequent year following the DJJ stay. So it will be making sure that we're looking at only those students that meet uh, both criteria. We're in a non-DJJ school in the prior year and in a non-DJJ school the subsequent year. We will be comparing then the average length of, or the average attendance rate of those students 
um, in the prior year to, compared to the subsequent year. Again, meeting the requirements in all of these that the, the student was at, at the DJJ program for at least 40 days. The graduation rate will follow the same methodology that the Department of Education uses for its uh, four-year cohort graduation rate, except that we are going to provide an additional one year, so it will be a five-year cohort. Um, so basically, as kids come into uh, ninth grade, uh, we're going to be following them up for the next five years to see whether or not they graduated. If the, if the, if the DJJ program is the last program, our last school that the youth attended, then they will be in the denominator, and then we, the numerator will be of those that actually graduated. Certified teachers. Uh, this is simply we're going to look at the percentage of the core courses that are taught by action, the teachers that have a true certification in the subject area. Data integrity is going to be looking at um, how, what percentage of the win assessment is, is um, being reflected of the actual student population um, at, at the program. So we're going to be making sure that, uh, that there is an um, assessment to begin with, at least a pre-assessment, and then we'll also be looking at whether or not there was a post-assessment associated with that youth. Um, our, our concern here in looking at some of the data initially is that there were a lot of people that weren't providing post-assessments on these youth. Post-secondary enrollment, we're following up um, the graduation, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the actual exit cohort, I was going to say the graduation pool, but no, this is the actual ex exit cohort and seeing whether or not um, those youth are followed up into a post-secondary placement. That will only include students with a diploma or GED at the time of the exit, so it will be a graduation group, um, though it's not going to be the exact same cohort. We'll also be looking uh, whether or not youth were found to have been employed um, this is only going to look at youth that were at least 16 uh, years of age at the time of release and that they were not uh, attending a post-secondary institution. So this is to capture those situations where youth, instead of going to a post-secondary institution, um, uh, took on a job. We will use our FET-PIP system at the Florida Department of Education to look for those students. Industry certifications and digital tools. Uh, currently, this is only applying for the programs that have a length of stay design of nine, nine months or longer, so the secure residential programs. Uh, we will look to see how many of the industry certifications were actually completed, not just started or had, but completed in the either the current year of the examination uh, that they were enrolled or the subsequent year following it. So it gives at least a, a, a year's worth of time to complete the industry certification. So the procedures for calculating the scores and ratings, like I said before, everything will be a percentage-based, then um, put onto a three-point scale then the average of the three-point scale depending on the number of components that um, were part of the individual program's evaluation will then uh, be derived into some sort of decimal of the one to three-point scale. And then we will also be um, putting uh, into place some things to ensure accuracy and the uh, representativeness of the data. Um, superintendents um, shall appoint a DJJ accountability contact in each district. Uh, the contact must work with DJJ to ensure that the data are accurately reported. 
and um, and then there's uh, more language in there that describes the conditions for withholding a rating or awarding an incomplete rating. Great, thank you, Greg. Yep. And I'm sure we may have some questions that come up here in a few minutes. There's um, just a couple other things I just wanted to reference because we wanted to make sure that we tied this in to the locked out report and really um, describe um, how we plan to use the outcome data. And there are several things that are built into um, the legislation that dictates how we're going to use the data and um, obviously being used to evaluate our schools and also we have to share that outcome data annually through the reports to the governor and the legislature. And also it's going to help determine which of the schools are going to be required to receive on-site reviews because we're not going to get to the point where everybody has an on-site review like it used to be, but we are going to be able to use this data to determine the lowest performing that, that need that on-site review so that we can provide that technical assistance. And we do envision being able to also um, pair the mentor-mentee sites so that we can um, have those relationships built across districts and providers because those have proven um, effective, you know, previously. And we really want to be able to showcase those best practices um, and, you know, hopefully we'll have um, folks that are able to participate in national webinars and, and showcase what they're doing. And of course, we want to make sure that within the local sites, we're sharing that data with not only the principals and superintendents, but we want to make sure that the facility treatment staff are also um, able to use that data and we want to encourage those mutual accountability teams at the site level so that, um, you know, they can review the data together and help, um, you know, affect change. And also um, sharing the information with the school justice partnerships. Throughout the state, we do have um, strong school justice partnerships in certain areas of the state and um, we envision that this could also be information that those partnerships would like to use um, moving forward. Now we've talked a little bit about on-site reviews and um, you know we have not figured out exactly how that's going to work because there, are, there is um, a process that we still have to play out with additional rule development, but the Department of Juvenile Justice, um, we were allocated four positions um, for regional educational positions and we do envision that these particular education coordinators are going to help support the DJJ education programs and the transition functions and they are going to be part of that process when we get to the on-site reviews for particular um, DJJ schools. And prior to that point, they're already serving on quality improvement reviews, which is a review that happens for the, the DJJ facility, not the education side, but the entire facility. And some of their standards um, obviously look at transition and there are some things that relate to education as far as like following the schedule, you know, um, transferring the kids, you know, according to the schedule and those types of things. So our education coordinators are already involved in that process. And we really want to get to the point where those coordinators can help um, facilitate that on-site review process and also really coordinate uh, long-term like data review teams within the districts and this be uh, one part, piece of the data that they're um, looking at within the district. As far as implementation status, um, we've given you a lot of information now. Um, we are at the point now, um, as Greg mentioned, there's um, the public input is, is being um, collected at this point on the proposed rule that has those 10 measures. And um, I believe we're still on target for the anticipated uh, State Board of Approval in January. And then there is an additional um, program improvement rule that is still in the drafting stage, so it will have to go through that entire, um, you know, rule development process. And that's where it will be defined further exactly um, what the process will look like um, as far as if a program um, scores at the bottom and has to receive that on-site review. Um, Nina mentioned um, talking about some of the success and challenges, and one of the things that um, I think is a great success is that we do have buy-in from our providers and districts and they are at the table um, eager to participate in the discussions um, regarding this evaluation process and like I mentioned at the beginning, many of those providers were at the table writing this legislation so this is something that they're seeing come full circle. Um, on the flip side of that, a challenge to this is the time that it takes to go through that entire rule development process and get to the point where 
we have the data to to review and react to. It's a it is a a, process, a tedious process, and it does take you know obviously it's taken over a year's time, and sometimes um, you know that presents challenges as well. Um, we also you know feel like the success through making sure that there are opportunities for that um, sample data to be reviewed. I think that would be something that the providers would providers and districts would speak to as far as that they are. Um, you know, thrilled that they they are able to come to the table and actually be a part of that and review that before it moves into the review and acceptance process. And um, as far as challenges, I mean, so far with with some of the feedback being received, I think what we're hearing from some is that they're concerned that some of the measures are things that they feel like they may not have control over as far as it's outside of their control whether or not the student attends school when they leave the facility. Those types of things would be a challenge. Um, so those would be the things that I would reference as success and challenges um, at this point. But again, we have a long way to go, but we're certainly um, excited about where we're headed and I'm glad to be able to be a part of this and share it with, with other states. And um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Nina. Great. Thank you so much, Julie, and, and thank you, Greg. Um, we have about 15 minutes or so for some Q&A, and we have some great questions already from some of the participants. Um, so uh, one of the questions is really, you know, uh, hits the core of a lot of the conversation that we've been having today regarding the use of data. Um, and so one participant asked the question as to, you know, why states aren't using data to guide program development or implementation? Is it staff capacity? Is it a lack of funding? You know, what is really the, the barrier or challenges that states are facing in terms of collecting and using this data? And um, before I turn it over to, to our panelists, I mean, we asked this question in our national survey in terms of what the biggest challenges were to the use of data, of student outcome data. And what we found um, was that a lot of states are struggling with just weak data systems. 30% of states responded that they have um, below average or weak data systems, and they're not able to capture this information in an electronic way. They also talked about lack of resources, as well as a lack of collaboration between juvenile justice and state and local education agencies. Um, Christine, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit in terms of Massachusetts approach, given that you have a great relationship with the Department of Education and you have this data sharing agreement. Can you talk a little bit about how you address those challenges? Sure, happy to. Um, I saw that question as well, and I wanted to say yes. <laughs> I feel like it. it is, um, I'm not sure for us, to be honest with you, funding is an issue, except if you, if you think about funding for um, staff capacity. Um, but I, I, for us in Massachusetts, we have had this MOU in place um, for several years, which was really um, f to get front end data, really to be able to ensure that we were serving the young person coming into our facilities in an appropriate way, especially around IEPs. Um, but out of that obviously grew that we had this kind of rich data and, um, but at the same time, Massachusetts was, we were implementing a new juvenile justice enterprise management system that just went online within the last year, 18 months. Um, and if anyone has ever gone through that process, you know that even a year, 18 months out, um, there, we're still developing some pieces and also being able to really, um, uh, quality control the data that has been in there because you you almost need um, a full year or even more of data to really track um, to see if your quality is um, c controlled and and really where you want it to be. So I I think for us um, we have had this this relationship with um, you know our. Um, with uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, it's been, that's been great. And really now the next step is, and I, this is, you know, I, we have other information on this, um, but as we answer their survey, we are just now kind of digging deep into the data and we really hope that, you know, if we were having this conversation a year from now, we would be able to have um, 
a much more uh, robust conversation and a richer conversation around the data that we have and what we can look at. And we are looking at um, cohorts of our young people um, that are uh, coming into our facilities, um, but mostly on our uh, post-adjudication side, um, but some on our pre-adjudication side. Um, so we, we, but I will tell you the challenge is really around, I do think for us it's a staff capacity issue. It, I'm not sure um, we've I, I do believe we're in an administration right now that outcome data has become very important and extremely important to be honest with you and so we're hoping I hope that we'd out see some resources to kind of back that priority up um, so I do think that it has been in some sense a lack of capacity in having the right people um, looking at the data. We have people that can enter the data, but it's really then having um, the right person to analyze that data, if that makes sense. And I do think it's a competing priority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to answer that question, yes, because I think it's a little bit <laughs> of everything. <laughs> Yeah, and that's definitely what we found um, in the survey that folks that responded to one barrier also said that they faced the other barriers at the same time, that it wasn't just one thing. Um, Julie, I, I want to ask the same question to you, but also in combination with another question that we got from an audience member, um, given that a lot of the literature right now advocates for youth being in placement facilities for a shorter period of time, how can states use data to evaluate school performance when youth may be in these schools for very short periods of time and how you all are developing your accountability system to account for that. But at the same time, if you could address some of the challenges around data collection and capacity as you all are complement, contemplating this new um, framework. Okay, I'll do my best and then um, Greg, if you wanna add to that. Um, one of the challenges that, that we see is that every district, of course, has their own management information system and each of the districts are responsible for the education in their DJJ program. So we do see in some of the districts, they are using their data on a regular basis. Um, I'm actually in a district now that is, is um, doing some site visits this week and they are meeting on a regular basis with their teachers to review the student outcome data as recently as every week they're having data chats on the student's progress within the DJJ program. So kind of answering the shorter term, they're looking at that progress, you know, on the particular assignments and towards their individual goals as often as weekly. Now as far as the data that will be used for the accountability measures, all of that data is going to be, Greg, I believe at least a year, a year in the rear, right? Uh, yes, for, the, for, for most of the measures, that's correct. So that presents a challenge because when you, you know, issue a, a um, accountability report card, I guess if you, you know, we don't have a terminology like that, but so everybody's clear on what we're referencing, that type of um, report and folks are aware that the data is that old and maybe they've had two groups of students cycle through since that time, that does present a challenge for them to be able to say, okay, those are current issues based on this data Instead, what we hear is, well, those students have long gone and we have, you know, a new group of students, so that may not apply now, but what we have to make sure that we're recognizing is they are getting, you know, similar students, similar population, and the process for the Department of Education to retrieve that data through those um, files and, per, you know, and turn the data around to put into these reports that does take a while, so we have to recognize that, you know, we have to use the data that we have available, and I think as the group came together to determine if there were additional measures that could be added um, or suggested, one of the things that, you know, there were several um, measures that folks would like to see, but there is no current method to collect that, but the employment and the post-secondary data is data that, that DOE collects in a different way through FETPIP, I believe that um, Greg was mentioning, and they are able to add that into these measures, which, you know, does um, benefit because we do have, you know, a large population of students that are coming out and, and you know, getting into jobs and, and staying in jobs as well. So we want to capture that. So hopefully that was helpful. Greg, did you want to add anything? Uh, sure, yeah. The, I, think, I think one of the major challenges most other states face, uh, whether it's for juvenile justice data or education data, is the decentralization 
of things that are out there. So um, Florida is unique in, in the sense that both of our agencies has a statewide system um, in which we collect information. Um, DJJ especially, um, I know I heard earlier one of the challenges that a lot of states face is that um, they may collect state-operated uh, data, but they don't collect the private um, operated program information. And so um, I think that that's a real benefit for Florida in, in that regard. And, and of course, um, because of that, then DJJ and DOE has a, has a good working relationship to be able to um, collaborate in that effort to, to, to capture that stuff. I think um, uh, that really is at the heart of why it, we're able, able to do the kind of accountability that we are, even though it does take time for data to get to us. And she is, um, Julie was right about the fact that each district has its own information system, but there is a, a process by which they have to submit that information to the state level. And so there's there's just a time lag, and that's true with almost all outcome evaluations, uh, whether we're talking about recidivism evaluations or we're talking about education outcomes. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I think we have time for another question or two, um, and I want to get to a little bit around um, the actual services um, that are provided in facilities. Um, Christine, can you talk a little bit about the partnerships you have um, if you have any with employers or strategies that you found to be successful in making connections between vocational training that are provided in facilities and employers. I know you talked a little bit in your presentation around the industry, you know, certifications or programs that you provide. Um, can you talk about those partnerships um, as well? Sure. So in our facilities, um, we they're mostly in our longer term um, facilities. We have um, a few of the programs we have running. We we have two greenhouses um, in different parts of the state. Um, we have a silk screening program that is a social enterprise business run by youth, um, obviously with adult oversight um, and an adult manager. Um, that is run in the western part of our state. We have a culinary program um, in. Um, one part of the state and about to um, start a new one in um, the western part of the state. We have the CTEC program. So these are all um, just honestly um, opportunities that arose from interest of um, both the young people and the staff in the, the facilities having the capacity to pull off um, this type of programming. Um, so, you know, obviously, not everywhere probably could have a greenhouse, but we have facilities um, that were able to accommodate that. The other piece, though, that actually um, is not included here, and uh, you know, uh, Nina, I'm sure when you send out stuff, um, my email is not on my slides. I should have I should have done that. Is we have another program called Bridging the Opportunity Gap. It's a career readiness and employment program, and it really is. Um, it's an it's a, a process that Commonwealth Corporation, our partner, actually oversees and manages. That is for our community. Um, the young people that um, transition back into the community. Um, I have a lot of um, resources around that. Um, we put out a response, um, a request for um, re uh, responses on that in RFR um, and RFP, a uh, request for proposals. It, it is a process, um, it's, it's very tight, it has um, very strict you know, guidelines, but we, we do, it has requirements in there around how many hours of creative readiness, but also um, making sure that anybody that applies for that um, is able to pull off either subsidized or unsubsidized employment for young people, depending on that type of programming. And we've really worked with a lot of community organizations. Um, we have about 18 of those that run year round um, throughout the state. So um, I'm happy to get folks information on that. Um, it's probably a longer conversation but we definitely have had um, some success in that. Great, and as a follow-up, another question someone had was around connection to post-secondary. You know, as folks are developing re-entry plans and as transition coordinators or education career coordinators are working with youth, how are they developing plans that go beyond just their immediate needs of, you know, transitioning into a public school or a vocational program? but going, you know, further into career development or post-secondary education. So I, I can start with Massachusetts and I can answer someone else's question. The Education and Career Counselors, um, they are um, 
they are employed by the Collaborative for Educational Services, so they are part of that education contract that we have. Um, but they, and those folks are connecting. It, it is part of their um, workload to connect with post-secondary um, institutions for young people. Um, that said, we've had a, on, 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 since I've been here 20 years, we've had an ongoing relationship with um, one of the community colleges in, in Boston, and it was the first community college that they actually, in the olden days before anything was online, um, did um, distance courses with us. Um, they had mail, they had mail work to the kids. The kids would mail it back and and, and actually get um, grades for that. Obviously, now that we've entered the world of technology, um, they were also the first um, community college that um, we, we do online courses with um, when the young people are in our residential programming. So. Um, Again, I know people don't have the same infrastructure, and that was why we were highlighted in the report. Um, it sounds like you know Florida and and Julie's kind of moving to some folks with some infrastructure. Those regional folks, um, I, I that has been really um, you know just getting on the ground and pounding the pavement and um, having connections with folks and having having a person go to a community college and actually um, work with them on able to provide um, online um, courses um, for our young people. That said, um, we, we have other young people now because everything is online. We are um, piloting in many of our programs where a young person might be taking different online courses um, in different institutions. Um, and that, again, is, um, you know, just kind of having, having the ability to research some of those courses and make sure they're appropriate for young people. Um, I always say we have a rolling admission um, in DYS, so, you know, kids don't come in in January and leave in, you know, May like they do any regular um, college. So um, we have to look at some of those um, those those guidelines and whether or not a young person will be with us if they, if they are transitioning back into the community, are we able to make sure ensure that um, they are uh, hooked up in the community to finish that class, things like that. So it does take um, some some work, but we have made some of those connections. I, I, don't, I don't know if Julie wants to add. Yes, I think the connections that you're referencing are, are exactly what's happening. We, you know, the majority of the students are not housed in the communities that they live in when they're in a residential program. So what we end up um, seeing is that they would start with an online course in a community um, college that's in the location closest to their residential program because that principal has been able to build a relationship with the admission staff there and they have, you know, gone through all of the hoops with you know the email address and the challenges that our population may face once they're enrolled into an online course. And then when they transition back, they continue with those online courses so they make sure that what they're enrolling in is something that they can continue um, throughout the process through the online process. And we do have a, a, um, a opportunity for students to apply for like a financial assistance. Of course, all of them we, we help with the federal financial aid, but there's also a a smaller um, kind of scholarship program that our agency, um, agency's foundation houses that we can help on a limited basis if they're not eligible for financial aid and the parents cannot pay, but we do have um, some opportunities to help with that. And it also helps with things like if they're going to a job site and they need a tool belt or work boots or those types of things, so it's an application process and we've tried to streamline that and make it um, very user friendly for the youth, so we have seen great success with those opportunities because we we want to do what we can to remove those barriers so that they can go on to that next step. Great, great. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Greg. This has been a tremendous amount of information. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating in, in today's webinar as well. Just before we end. I want to bring everyone's attention to a couple other resources that were released recently by the Council of State Governments Justice Center, um, and we'll be having webinars on both of these resources in January. The first is a set of checklists um, to help state policymakers reduce juvenile recidivism. A webinar will take place on January 14th to walk through this resource. And on January 15th, we'll host a webinar that will review another report recently released on improving outcomes for young adults um, or transitional age youth in the juvenile and adult criminal justice systems. And additional information on these webinars and registration links will be sent out in the next few weeks. 
Um, this concludes the webinar for today. Again, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you to Christine, Julie, and Greg for all of the information they provided. After you exit the webinar, a brief survey will appear on your screen. Um, by answering the questions, you'll be able to help our resource center improve the services that we offer. We'd greatly appreciate if you take just a few moments to complete the survey when the webinar ends. We'll email a link to the recording of this webinar as well as a link to a PDF of the PowerPoint slides that were used by all presenters today. Um, we'll email that early next week. Um, the links will also be made available on the National Reentry Resource Center's website. And again, please remember to subscribe to the National Reentry Resource Center's newsletter at csgjusticecenter.org backslash subscribe. And we have a newsletter specifically for youth issues. Thank you again for your participation in today's webinar and hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Nina, Nina, are you still on?